Uh, there were some on the right concerned that it was going to be a dud, some on the left uh, it, insisting, you know, that this was going to go nowhere. But in the end, it turns out that Devin Nunes brought a lot to the table here. Uh, let's go through some of the key takeaways in the memo. First of all, that that dossier was key to the FBI and the Justice Department's application to end up spying on members of the Trump team. Also, that the FISA court, that secret court, was never told about the dossier's political roots. They were told that there was some political motivation here, but not, not that it was paid for by the DNC in the Clinton campaign. The court never told that Christopher Steele, the former British spy, was passionately anti-Trump, as we learned in the memo. We'll get into that. Mm -hmm. And finally, maybe the most important point, and this is hotly disputed right now, but Andrew McCabe testified in December, according to this Republican memo, that the FISA warrant initially to uh, surveil Carter Page, the Trump advisor, resulted from the Steele dossier. That without the Steele dossier, he testified in private to the House Intelligence Committee, uh, they wouldn't have even gone to the FISA court. They wouldn't even tried to get a warrant for surveillance. Now, Democrats on that committee are insisting that is not what Andrew McCabe said. There's a transcript of what he said. Right, so I was say, how is that, exactly. I was just going to say, how can that be in dispute? It must be a transcript. But what it strikes me is that if if the Papadopoulos, uh, the, you know, the Democrats the say that the Papadopoulos meeting was what initiated this investigation, if that was enough, then why include the dossier to begin with? Um, to me, it's an admission that Papadopoulos wasn't enough and they right. actually needed because the dossier. in the summer of 2016, George Papadopoulos, the other Trump advisor, had met with an Australian diplomat. Correct. Then there was an attempt by the FBI and the Justice Department in the summer of 2016 to get a FISA warrant to start surveillance. That was denied, we're told. So it was not until roughly October 2016, with the dossier thrown in there, that they were able to start spying. Correct. Right. And taking a step back for a moment, I'm going to put the lawyer hat on. This whole thing offends me as a lawyer because you take an oath, and literally the words of that oath say, I will not misrepresent anything to a court. We had a bunch of lawyers misrepresent a lot to the FISA court by not saying about the political motivations of the Steele dossier. That is a huge problem, and those people should be embarrassed, and the bar should take a look at that because it's literally the only thing that you have to take an oath to do. That right. represent your clients, and they didn't do that. And you got to imagine that there's a FISA judge out there that's pretty angry about it. Very too, right? exactly. And what happens? I mean, does that person can can that person come out, or is it so secret that? Well, it is secret, but the question will be whether or not there was more evidence presented beyond the dossier right. that, in fairness, we do not know today. Was there a lot more than the dossier? What we do know from Devin Nunes, that's his contention, he's the chairman of the committee, that the dossier was central uh, to the initial FISA warrant. Uh, and so there may be a judge, and then there were multiple judges, by the way, because uh, there were four judges in all, because these wa this warrant was redone every 90 days right, right. up until uh, late 2017. Devin Nunes gave an exclusive interview with her own Brett Baird. Here's how he laid it out. When somebody first reads that dossier, I would think you would come away from that and think, okay, this is really pretty wild. This is wild stuff. Let's not forget where the dossier came from. It came from Russians. So, so there's clear evidence of collusion with the Russians. It just happens to be with the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee that uh, the news media fails to talk about or fails to even investigate. We are in the middle of what I call phase two of our investigation, which involves other departments, uh, specifically the State Department and some of the involvement that they had in this. Uh, that investigation is ongoing uh, and we continue to work towards uh, finding answers uh, and, and asking uh, the right questions to try to get to the bottom uh, of what exactly the State Department uh, was up to in terms of this Russian investigation. Uh, the State Department owner John Kerry, who, right. by the way, has been tweeting recently that this can't come out. And you just heard Devin Nunes say, we've also heard Sarah Carter say, Carter say this over the course of the last 24 hours. We're only about 10 to 15 percent. Mm the way through in this investigation. There's a lot of information, and the State Department could be the next ones in the crosshairs if you hear Devin Nunes. Could there be other, uh, I mean, we, we saw Carter Page, but could they have spied on other people within the campaign? Is that a possibility? Absolutely. Why do you think, just taking a step back, why do you think everybody on the left is so worried about this information coming out? There has to be a reason beyond just political and beyond just hatred of Donald J. Well, Trump. the man well, who has been that's saying... That's right. I was just going to say... Yeah. The man who has been saying what, me worry, is James Comey, who's been tweeting all these deep thoughts we've right. talked about on the show. 
Uh, yesterday, he reacted to this by saying, that's it. Dishonest and misleading memo wrecked the House Intel Committee, destroyed trust in, with the intelligence community, damaged relationship with FISA court, and inexcusably exposed classifies an investigation of an American citizen. For what? DOJ and FBI must keep doing their jobs. Two quick points there. One, uh, he doesn't dispute a single fact in the right. Republican memo. He right. gives talking points. But beyond that, let's not forget the timeline as well with James Comey. He's the FBI director in October of 2016 when the dossier is used for the uh, initial FISA warrant, number one. And then a couple months later, what does he tell President-elect Donald Trump in private? Oh, I need to tell you there's this dossier, but it's unverified. You use that to get a warrant to surveil the president-elect's people basically right. his inner circle right. and so uh, he's saying one thing and doing another well Devin Nunes is actually firing back and responding to this uh, let's take a look at what he has to say Mr. Comey had a chance in January February March April I believe all the way till June uh, to come clean on who paid for the dossier uh, he was asked about it in January and he said very clearly that he knew that Republicans had started the dossier which was a lie and then uh, when asked and probed further, well, who finished the dossier, he didn't know. Now, maybe he was lying, maybe he didn't know, but both seem to be a problem. Comey said in testimony that some of the dossier is unverified and salacious. Are there parts of the dossier that are true? Uh, what, that uh, Russia is a country and Carter Page is a person? I mean, other than that, I don't know anything. All right, so for the last week since we heard about the existence of this memo, what was the number one thing we heard from the left? It's going to endanger national exactly. security. Exactly. Yeah. National security. Exactly. We're going to be so jeopardized. The world's going to collapse. I don't know about you. I read this thing a couple times. I did not see, and granted, I'm not in this community, I did not see one thing to jeopardize national security. Somebody who did fight for our country, you know him. He's in Minnesota. His name is Pete Hegseth, and we bring him in right now. <laughs> Pete, you read this thing. Is there anything morning, in here that worries you from a national security perspective? Well, what worries me is is what the intelligence services did to jeopardize our national security right. by putting politics first. Read this memo. It's it reads to me like political sabotage. It reads to me like opponents of then candidate Trump wanting to do whatever they can to use information against him and undermine his presidency. And their whole point, their whole belief was that he would never be president. Hillary Clinton would be president. And as a result, none of this would come out. So this is part of a draining of the swamp. I'm glad, God bless Devin Nunes. God bless the president for pushing this information out and exposing what our DOJ and FBI did in trying to under, they under they are undermining faith in our process. Right. Not by exposing this, we're undermining faith in but our process. But aren't they, Pete, also undermining their own position? I mean, if they say the sky's gonna fall, this is, they are, they're claiming, I mean, all week long, I mean, there's been breathless reporting on the other side about uh, from from media from Democrats saying this is going to endanger national security the memo comes out there's nothing there that would endanger <laughs> their own credibility is is in jeopardy when they when they do things like this yeah, they want to muddy the waters. They know, they understand how bad this is. The only place reporting so much of this has been Fox News Channel and some conservative outlets. Otherwise, if you're watching the so-called mainstream media, you don't know a lot about this. So this isn't the bombshell, or at least you're surprised by it. And then when you start to unpack what's actually happened, if you are not familiar with this scandal, it really is one. So it's not new news to us, right? Uh, because we've been covering it. But man, it's a lot of there's a lot of there there. Pete, there's only one solution moving forward, and there needs to be a special counsel we all know that a special counsel to investigate why your minnesota vikings did not make it's it to the crucial. It's what america wants and to know you're an unkind man you really are I, i've been in minnesota trying to enjoy the super bowl but there's a melancholy over Sorry. this entire yeah. city there's no doubt at all <laughs> so uh, give us give us a little you, what, it's a feel for what's happening there because i'm obviously teasing you uh and vikings fans yeah. but patriots fans eagles fans and a lot of people around the country around the world give us a feel for what's happening yeah, I mean, a lot of excitement, obviously. This is one of America's holidays, the, the Super Bowl. So we've been doing what you do when you come to the Super Bowl. We had a big old party with Big Daddy, our own. We'll bring that to you here as well. I did an obstacle course called the Farm Bowl with two <laughs> Minnesota superstars, Stefan Diggs and, and uh, Kyle, Kyle Rudolph. Also interviewed T.O., Terrell Owens. Oof. All is going to come on the program. And, of course, it's the Super Bowl, guys, so I'm eating. we got a cheeseburger, uh, red <laughs> robin, we gourmet burger bar. We expect nothing less from you, Pete. I nothing thought we were less. the only ones who are going to be eating, but, of course, <laughs> he's right. eating on remote. Pete, we'll be getting to you every we'll you hour soon. this morning and tomorrow. We we're looking forward to it, buddy. We'll see you in a minute. Thanks, Pete. Now we're going to turn to headlines. The deadly flu.
taking more lives, showing no signs of slowing down, especially for children. 16 kids have died in the last week alone, according to the CDC report, bringing the total to 53 flu-related pediatric deaths this season as hospitalizations soar. Health experts strongly encouraging everyone who hasn't had a flu shot to get one. A judge says she will not punish the father of three girls sexually abused by Michigan sports doctor Larry Nasser after he charged towards him in court. Grant me five minutes in a locked room with this <laughs> demon. <laughs> Randall Margraves apologizing after a judge said there's no way he would be fined or jailed. I'm no hero. My daughters are the heroes and all the victims and the survivors of this a terrible atrocity. Sheriff is still investigating and Margraves could still face some charges. More proof President Trump is making America win again. Oh, I thought we had a thought there. Yeah. Okay, best so much, buy. You oh, may even get tired of winning and you'll say, please, Please, it's too much winning. Uh, Best Buy now giving out bonuses to more than 100,000 employees, joining a growing list of companies sharing a portion of their windfall from President Trump's corporate tax cut. The electronic retailer saying it will pay one-time bonuses of $1,000 to full-time workers and $500 to part-time workers. And those are your headlines. Yeah, no, those are just crumbs. Just yep. crumbs. <laughs> yeah, and then maybe they'll get their employees to buy uh, some flat screens for the Super Bowl. <laughs> there are a lot of names and faces in that FISA memo, so who are they and what are their roles in all all of this. The former CIA officer, Buck Sexton, breaks down the key players live next. Plus, while she was searching for love, police were um, searching for her. How that woman right there went. It's been only one day since the FISA memo was released. It's already a mess of names, faces. Maybe you're a little confused, so we want to explain who are the key players in this controversial memo and what do we need to know about them? Who better to break it to the players. Well, you had the confirmation of what was already believed to be the case about a number of these individuals based mm -hmm. on press reporting. So that was very important. I think the single biggest takeaway was that there was absolutely no security risk in the memo as it came despite out. Despite all the claims. Despite all of that stuff. And everyone I know from inside or who's now formally inside the community agrees that this was a memo that did not risk anyone's security and that people needed to know. All right, let's go to the tweeter in chief, James Comey, who keeps uh, going on Twitter, uh, you know, explaining his side of it, and yet there's a lot of explaining it. Still I'm still to. waiting for the Zen tweet from Comey with a lake in the background that will explain how all of this happened. But first, he certified three FISA requests, so he's clearly very much involved in this whole process. He also is the individual who got the Mueller probe started. So he's at the center of this. He leaked information that at least one member of Congress said was classified to the New York Times. Central the Hillary email leak probe, too, as we know. He was the one who stood up in front of the country and said that there would be no charges, which, as we know, was a very strange yeah, He tweeted maneuver. yesterday that it was Devin Nunes' fault that there was basically a quote-unquote classified leak of the Carter Page surveillance. On a serious note, about the former FBI director's tweets. What he put out yesterday was essentially one long series mm -hmm. of uh, exaggerations and falsehoods saying that this was somehow not helping anybody. It was destroying the relationship with the intelligence community. That's just essentially a pile of nonsense coming from the former FBI director, which I think is making people ask questions about how he could get something so wrong. Maybe he's really partisan. Maybe he's somebody that we should not Andrew trust. Andrew McCabe, what about him? McCabe, well, he came up in here specifically as somebody who also certified on his own one FISA request when he was acting FBI director. He testified, now this, there should, I should probably put a question mark next to that one. You have a member of Congress saying that behind closed doors, mm -hmm. he testified the dossier was central. If the dossier was in fact central to the FISA memo request, that's a very big deal. There's a lot of contention on whether that's true. The insurance policy text also Recently pushed out after his current boss, Christopher Ray, last weekend saw the memo. McCabe was out within 24 hours. Sort of interesting right there. Uh, let's go to Bruce Orr. Now, he is the individual who had the most personal contact that we know of, at least, with Christopher Steele, the author of the Fusion GPS dossier. And he has very close connections with, obviously, his wife, who was also at Fusion GPS and working on the dossier. And it seems that he concealed his connections or that his connections to Christopher Steele weren't shared with the FISA intelligence court. And even when Steele was maybe cut off, then all of a sudden Orr was backdoor getting information from Fusion GPS. The dirt diggers here, 
uh, and then feeding it back to the FBI, Justice Department, where he was, going back to the FISA court. And wouldn't we think that he would probably stay far away from the source once the FBI says, you know what, you're out of here? He did not. He kept it going. Sally Yates, at the beginning of the Trump administration, was very high and mighty. Yeah, she was somebody who seemed to be part of hashtag resistance from the position of being the acting attorney general. She actually has her name on one of these FISA applications, according to the Devin Nunez memo. And she also is somebody who reported the phone call between Flynn and Kislyak to the White House. The Russian ambassador. To, Russian ambassador, which led to all kinds of problems, and then refused to do her job. Hashtag resistance, very senior at DOJ. You want to, to use it, but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation. Some quick headlines on your Saturday morning. President Trump keeping his promise to strengthen our nuclear capabilities. The Pentagon just releasing a new policy to develop two low-yield nuclear warheads to send a message to Moscow. This as Russia develops a nuclear torpedo that can strike the U.S. The Trump administration accusing Vladimir Putin of violating a treaty by accumulating a stockpile of those tactical nuclear weapons. And the Department of Homeland Security issuing a warning ahead of the Olympics. Hackers could target Americans attending the games in South Korea. To keep personal information secure, the agency encouraging travelers to limit the use of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth technology. The games begin on Friday. Rachel, up to you. Thank you. A looming showdown over DACA. President Trump wants an immigration deal, but Democrats don't seem willing to come to the negotiating table. I would say we want to make a deal. I think they want to use it for political purposes for elections. I, I really don't. I really am not happy with the way it's going from the standpoint of the Democrats negotiating. DACA is something to absolutely be easy to do. And I don't think the Democrats want to take care of the DACA recipients. All right. Joining us now for very fair and balanced debate. Don Calloway, who is a Democratic strategist and former Missouri state representative, and Gus Portela is a Republican strategy. Welcome to both of you. Okay, Good morning, I'm, Rachel. Good morning, Gus. Good morning. morning. So I'm going to start with you, Don. Um, Trump is offering 1.8 million DACA recipients or DREAMers a path to citizenship. That's three times the number that Obama offered. And by the way, Obama was offering temporary status. This is a pathway to citizenship. Tell me why, you, why you're telling DREAMers or DACA recipients not to take this deal. That's complicated, but let's start from the beginning here. The president ended DACA in September. Uh, president Obama took executive action to make a pathway for citizens, excuse me, for uh, dreamers to stay here. Uh, DACA, ending DACA breaks up families, it destabilizes our economy, and President Trump ended it. So if he cared about DACA, if he cared about the real effect that these people have on our, the positive effects that these people have on our uh, our country, he wouldn't have ended it. So to create a crisis and then offer a pathway out of it is extremely disingenuous. Now, the so, president's path is quite amorphous. So the plan that he laid out is not one that Congress has taken out. It's not one that has details or any teeth to it. So the president saying path to citizenship is essentially a buzzword that really okay. doesn't have any teeth or any fundamental uh, understanding pinnings well, when you consider the idea that he ended the program in September to begin with. Right. Well, again, Obama was offering uh, a temporary status by right, ending but DACA. But wait a minute. It. Wait a minute. By ending DACA, you're offering um, a path to citizenship. It has to be done legislatively <laughs> through Congress. That's the legal way, the constitutional way it's done. That said, Gus, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, <laughs> progressive groups like La Raza who are against it. it LULAC, their president, came out in support of it and then um, had to retract it. Now his board wants him fired. Uh, and we're seeing Democrats, again, saying they won't even come to the negotiating table. Do you think that there is a political reason why Democrats do not want to have um, this resolution solved, perhaps by a Republican president and a Republican Congress? Well, absolutely there is. First of all, you know, Hispanic voters have uh, con uh, have been a central tenant of the Rep of the Democratic, um, you know, voters that come out during midterm elections. Mm -hmm. And why should Democrats come to the table at this point when they don't want to risk having them stay at home or even losing that uh, because they they don't have anything uh, that's that's you know that they're passionate about. Uh, not that's not to say that they're just passionate about immigration. I think uh, Hispanic voters are passionate uh, mostly about the economy and you know. 
they'll be happy to see that, uh, that they'll be getting more uh, more of what they earned in, in their paychecks, especially this coming month. But I think uh, mostly because uh, you know Democrats don't don't want to come to the table. But you well, know it's it's important that they do um, so that we can uh, well, so that we can get a deal done. If they don't, they're definitely putting the DACA recipients at risk, um, perhaps sacrificing them at the table Absolutely, of the, at the altar of the resistance. Um, Rachel, what put the right, DACA wait, recipients wait, at risk was ending the program. Well, now, why we won't come to the table from a legislative standpoint is the idea that it's tied, DACA has been inextricably tied by this president to the funding and building of the wall, which we fundamentally disagree with. So if you want to talk about the actual legislative proposal, which we really haven't seen, but we've heard about it in rhetoric, that's the reason why. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there, Gus. Thank you. And thank you also to, um, I mean, thank you, Don, and thank you, Gus. Thanks, Rachel. Um, appreciate thank you, it. Rachel. Still ahead, Dan Bongino is up next, plus Congressman Jim Jordan, Michelle Malkin, and Rob O'Neill all live and coming up. Plus, the Hawaii official who sent that false missile alert now speaking out for the first time. Why he says it's not his fault. And Pete's in Minneapolis having a Super Bowl party for the Super Bowl. You better Pete. believe it. <laughs> Come on, it's it's Wisconsin weather, Minnesota weather here at the Super Bowl. You know, it's not a Super Bowl without Super Bowl parties. They actually let Fox and Friends into one. And uh, we talked to David Deal, two-time uh, giant Super Bowl champion, Chad Greenway, Minnesota Viking. And you'll find out which, uh, which uh, Fox host. It's a disgrace. When you look at that. And you see that and so many other things, what's going on. Uh, a lot of people should be ashamed of themselves and much worse than that. He has abdicated his responsibilities as commander in chief to protect the American people by protecting our intelligence sources and the rest. If the president uses this fake, horrible release of, of, uh, of distorted intelligence as an excuse to fire Rosenstein or Mueller, it, it could lead to a constitutional crisis. And with that as the backdrop, let's bring in Dan Bongino. Mr. Bongino, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, especially on Post Memo Day. And I was watching some of the other shows yesterday, other networks, and I heard the phrase nothing burger uttered. Your response. Nothing burger? You mean like the lighting up of the Constitution, the shredding of the Constitution, the using of the Constitution as toilet paper? You know, I don't know what I'm more disgusted by. Uh, the memo? Or the, or, the, or the filthy media uh, acolytes and, and their liberal bootlickers um, pretending that there's nothing in that memo. Let's just be crystal clear about what's in that memo. The Donald Trump team was spied on. It was spied on due to a dossier the number two at the FBI said would have never, this dossier was critical to getting those warrants to spy on people. You know, elements of the police state guys are already here, and they're all here to, the, to rounds of applause by the Democrats and their media buddies. It's, it's a real shame what happened. Dan, you, you say that this is one of the most consequential scandals in um, American politics in recent memory. Um, you also are very good about bringing up Obama in this, who seems to have gotten off clean. Um, but this all happened under his watch, or a lot of this. You know, it, I, I, I used to say it was likely one of the more consequential. It is now the most consequential, no question, political scandal in American history. Let's be absolutely clear what happened. The Obama team, during a critical political election, found a way to circumvent U.S. law, jump over judicial restraint, and found a way to spy on the Donald Trump team. After Donald Trump's elected president, and he's in that transition phase, they find a way to basically reverse engineer crimes against the Trump people to justify prosecutions into people like General Mike Flynn. I mean, I mean, folks, listen, Rachel, this is an important point here. These are political disagreements here. These are disagreements about who we are as a country. If nothing is done about what happened to the Trump team, we are already in the midst of a cold civil war. There's no doubt about it. Dan, would you acknowledge, though, at least you've made a, a lot of important points, but that at least the way it's supposed to work with FISA, and obviously we're going to learn a lot more in the days ahead as to whether or not the Constitution was shredded, as you suggested, at the top, but that the way it's supposed to work is that the dossier would have been maybe a key piece, as Republicans are claiming, but that there was other evidence that we're not seeing today, that that FISA warrant is dozens and dozens of pages, and there's at least a possibility to be fair, that there's more evidence there that was used to get the FISA warrant. 
You know, Ed, listen, as a former federal agent, if I were to go into federal court, right? So let's just set up. You're saying, okay, the dossier may have been a piece of a larger evidence portfolio. Yeah. Let's say I walk into federal court and I'm a federal agent uh, involved in a murder case, right? And I testify in court that I found the body. And me finding the body is a small piece of evidence in the case. There's a gun, there's other stuff. And all of a sudden, the guy who's supposed to be dead walks in the back of the court and says, hey, I'm here. <laughs> well, that's a pity, pretty big piece of right. evidence yeah. that went out the door. The dossier was, according to the number two at the FBI, the central core focus of the FISA warrant. That's not Dan right. Bongino talking. Right. That is the number two agent at the FBI. I'm sorry. This was a shredding of the Constitution. Full stop. Dan, I want to get your opinion on the following. It kind of got lost in the shuffle with, obviously, Memo Gate yesterday. A judge blocked the release of Comey's memos documenting conversations with President Trump. Why does this matter? It matters because this entire special counsel investigation was started by Jim Comey's leaking of classified information in those very same memos he wrote. It's clear now that Jim Comey had some personal animus towards Donald Trump, and, and his, his sole target seemed to be to start a special counsel and then subsequent impeachment hearings later on. Jim Comey was a political actor at the end. He was not a law enforcement right. actor. Thank you, Dan. You always do a good job of breaking this down and helping us focus on what really matters in these important moments. So thank you so much for good joining us Dan. this morning. Good to see you. I'm shocked that Dan was fired up. Yeah. I don't know about you. Yeah. Uh, no. All right, turning now to your headlines. Going on, the popular reality TV show The Bachelor requires disappearing from your regular life. But one contestant reported missing in November. She was in fact found competing on the reality dating show. Becca Martinez was among a recent was among a recent article featuring 35 missing persons in California. The reality star telling a sheriff's deputy that she was working on a marijuana farm during the time of her reported disappearance. Speaking out on Twitter, Martinez wrote, Mom, how many times do I have to tell you I don't get cell service on The Bachelor? Wow. Racially insensitive. That's what some people are calling the movie Cool Runnings, a true story about a Jamaican bobsled team qualifying for the 1988 Olympics. Feel the rhythm. Feel the ride. Get on up. It's bobsled time. Cool Runnings. Complaints prompting Massachusetts Wayland High School's principal to cancel a viewing of the Disney classic, which she says no longer fits the institution's values. Meanwhile, the Jamaican women's bobsled team making it to next week's Winter Olympic Games for the first time ever exactly 30 years after the men. So a true story is racially insensitive. That's right. Wow. <laughs> the Hawaii officials sending the false missile alert sparking statewide panic is now speaking out claiming he was 100% sure that the threat was real. The message that I heard uh, was this is not a drill, and I didn't hear exercise at all from in the message or from my coworkers. A preliminary report finding the drill had no procedures in place to prevent a person from mistakenly sending an alert. The fired worker now saying the state of state emergency management agency deserves the blame. Wow. And those are your headlines. Saying he might even sue the state. Yeah. Speaking of that state of Hawaii, we should all ask to go out there to interview that individual because it is a lot Hasn't warmer there fun. than it is <laughs> here, Rick Reichmuth. Good morning, Rick. A little good morning. Yeah, a little bit better there than at least anywhere across mm -hmm. the eastern part of the country. Really cold. Uh, moisture coming back in. A little bit of snow coming across parts of the northern plains, including uh, Minneapolis. So the snow coming in today. Take a look at these cold temperatures. We were cold, obviously, a lot in January. We've been kind of in a seesaw thing. That's where we are again.